Red Sea Journey Ours was not a pilgrim ship, not at any rate at first. Suez seemed as Suez so often seems, hot and dusty, built on a kind of slope, as punishing to the feet as the local taximan's demands are to the purse. Stamped deeply at the time in its hopes as well as by its street signs with an unmistakable military presence, it felt somehow uneasy, brooding. I was now a pilgrim, heading southwards through the canal and the Red Sea, bound for Jeddah, the main port of Saudi Arabia. When he saw my visa, the passport officer shrugged to his colleague of the customs. Pilgrims, it seemed from his remarks, never had anything much dutiable. I wondered, as I always do, why there should be so much preoccupation about people leaving the country. I had paid, quite generously I thought, for the privilege of having my baggage examined upon entering. But there it was, and the usual procedure would have to be followed. It is difficult to say whether this unvarying ritual is naive, kindly, or even lax. But the fact that I had seen about twenty of my future travelling companions go through it meant that I was prepared. Thus, when the customs man fixed me with a penetrating gaze, I was not surprised to hear the exultant ha-ha of his fellow strategically stationed directly behind me and calculated, it seemed, to cause the intending smuggler immediately to leap out of his skin with fear and confess all. Having survived this, I walked up the gangplank into a smallish vessel, clean enough but somehow too all metal for this broiling sun. When we got under way, I was to think of this, to reflect that if I felt discomfort at the unyielding character of a steel ship, how much more aching must have been the regret of people used to the generous movement of wooden walls with the white canvas billowing out above. Both the captain and the inevitably red-haired engineer were Scots. The crew hailed from various parts of the valley of the Nile. The passengers seemed to be of every nation except Egypt. As we started, the call to midday prayer sounded from the third class and steerage where the patient pilgrims sat. A peasant Turkoman in felt boots, he had walked almost all the way from Persia, stood leading the worshippers facing Mecca woods. Only three so far were dressed in pilgrim white, Ahmed the Somali, his wife, and their six-year-old son Abdullah. On our own deck, a Saudi sheikh, a Syrian agronomist, and two Turkish journalists had already made friends. An American, bound for Aden, read Sherlock Holmes and called for tea every half hour. The incessant blurred rhythm of Arabic music haunted every corner of the deck. Loudspeakers carried the Cairo radio programs from dawn to dusk. As we negotiated the chain of connected lakes which make up the canal, two days' steaming brought about a complete change of mood aboard the ship. It was as if we were in another world. Everything of Cairo had been forgotten. There were no smells, no teeming hordes of curious and idle lingerers, nothing but the throb of the engines and the white birds circling overhead. We were but four days from Jeddah now, from the land to sea which some of us had walked for years, others saved all their lives. The first unusual event was the complete abandoning of all distinctions between first and third class passengers. Though they spent most of their time in their own part of the ship, all passengers mixed freely and made one another welcome. One more pious, perhaps, than others, prevailed upon the radio officer to discontinue the relaying of music. Under awnings the faithful sat, prayed, or read books.
The westernized first-class travelers now paced the deck in flowing robes. The Syrian still watered his plants five times a day, and he was growing a beard. I, too, stopped shaving, because it would have been discourteous to appear before the king clean-shaven, if I was to see the king, that was. The American complained that the puritanical Saudi sheikh had thrown all playing cards overboard as inventions of the devil. One might have said, if this were not a phrase with completely irrelevant associations, that we were reverting to type. This was the transition period. The women passengers formed a group of their own under the presidency of the wife of one of the clerics of the Mecca sanctuary, who was returning from a visit to her sister in Cairo. She coached them in the recitations and prayers to be used during the pilgrimage, and spoke of the work that she was doing in social welfare and for the benefit of the children in the southerly province, the Hejaz. I seemed to be the person with the best grasp of English, and the American soon attached himself to me. He questioned me rather narrowly as to the motives for my journey, what I expected to get out of it, and the conditions of life in Saudi Arabia. Eventually, the American asked me to take him to Mecca. He would be allowed, he said, to land at Jeddah. This was not a forbidden city. Once there, it should be possible, though not easy, to get into Mecca. He was willing to pay all expenses. He was willing, even, to reimburse me for my trouble. But I had troubles enough, and I told him that I would like to do it, but that being on a pilgrimage, I could not be a party to such a deception. Was he a Muslim? He was not. In that case, you would not get much benefit out of going to Mecca, I said. But he wanted to be the first American to go there. After all, Mecca was far more impenetrable than Tibet. He knew. He'd been to Tibet. Nothing to it, he told me. If he became a Muslim, would he be able to get in? I told him it was possible, but it would take time and perseverance. It might take years before he was sufficiently trusted. Even then, a false move could mean death. It has happened before. I reminded him that times were even more difficult than when such men as Burton got through in disguise. Today you have to run the gauntlet of walkie-talkie apparatus, identity cards and pilgrim passports, plus having to know the rituals and ways of Islam. Suspense suppressed excitement, the feeling of a profound experience soon to come throbbed in every pilgrim heart as we neared Jeddah. In the brilliant hardness of the early morning sunlight, Saudi Arabia was sighted. For the first time, as the white-garbed faithful lined the rails, I heard the immemorial pilgrim chant to be repeated again a thousand times during my stay there. La Beik, Alohuma, La Beik. We are here, O Lord, we are here. Gleaming whitely, coral built beyond those treacherous reefs through which ships cannot pass to her quayside, Jeddah beckoned, and Mecca, only fifty miles eastward through the desert. Amid the cheers of the crew and chanting of the first chapter of the Quran, the opening, we got into small boats and were ferried to the jetties where annually upwards of a hundred thousand Muslims land, from Morocco, Java, and almost every eastern country. Even before we reached the shore, striking evidence of the contrasts in a changing east abounded. Perched within the harbour on coral outcrops, fishermen were angling for the food which makes up so much of the protein diet of Jeddah's poorer citizens. Large hoardings, inscribed in Arabic, Indonesian, and half a dozen other tongues, proclaimed, Pilgrims, Saudi Arabia welcomes you. Bronzed and hefty porters, their girdled costumes unchanged since Abraham's day, unloaded a Pakistani ship to the strains of the traditional haunting shanty of their trade. 
Stacked in immense heaps, merchandise from all the world lay awaiting customs examination in the huge concrete buildings so new that the roofs were actually being put on while they were in active use. This was just a symptom of the age of plenty which multi-million dollar American oil royalties have brought to Arabia. The Turkoman was already in tears as we landed and spoke of the sand getting in his eyes as we shook hands in farewell. Before Ibn Saud conquered this country, the peninsula was divided into the austere northern part, Nejd, and this, the southern, easy-going Hejaz. Even today, thirty years later, the king keeps his capital in Riyadh, towards the Persian Gulf, and foreign embassies accredited to Saudi Arabia must remain by law in Jeddah, dotted in their graceful mansions around the curving inland bay. Each group of pilgrims went to the arched hall of pilgrim reception for refreshment, identification, and allocation of guides. I put my bags on the customs bench and opened them. I had not expected any special treatment, but as soon as I presented my passport, a gorgeously robed sheikh of the Administration of Hospitality took charge of me. I was ushered into a modern American car and driven rapidly through the dazzling ultra-modern streets to the Diafa, guest apartments of the king. Entering the thickly carpeted, cool vastness of the hall of reception, I felt some diffidence in giving my full name to the manager. This white-robed figure, with the twin camel-hair circlets of the Bedouin on his head, I felt might harbour some antagonism towards descendants of the Prophet on political grounds. I knew that the Saudis would not permit any privileged class and expected some sort of adverse reaction. However this may once have been, it is no longer the case. I was announced to the assembled gathering with many a high-flown title. Grave, bearded faces courteously composed, they rose and we kissed each other's hands. When I got to the middle of the horseshoe of armchairs which formed the assembly, a giant, red-bearded elder noticed my hesitation. I am the doctor in charge of the quarantine, he told me, with an Edinburgh lilt to his excellent Arabic. Like all foreigners in Saudi Arabia, he wore the white robe and sand-brown Bedouin cloak woven from the hair of the Kuwait camel. I was later to meet several such men, engineers, doctors, scientists, from Britain, America, Czechoslovakia or France, Saudi officials now, and remarkably confident in their adopted characters of what are locally called Musta Arabin, Arabized ones, just as Robert of Chester and Michael Scott were known as Musta Arabi in the Moorish Spain of an earlier age. Upon reflection, it is hard to say why one should at first feel this change to be so odd. Why should it be taken for granted that an Arab may live in Britain as the British do, yet the reverse appears so unusual or difficult? I sent a radio telegram to the king at Riyadh, announcing my arrival and stating that I was ready to fly to the capital to render him homage after performing my essential pilgrimage duties in the holy city. The new post office building where I sent this message was an eye-opener. Today's Arab buildings in Jeddah are built in a blending of the ancient and western styles and equipped with what seems a complete disregard for expense. Faisal Street, named after King Faisal, formerly the Viceroy of the Hejaz, runs through the centre of the new town, right up to the docks. And this, at the other end of the city, joins the Pilgrim Way, the newly macadamed road leading to Mecca itself. Dominated on both sides by immense steel and concrete structures, apartment houses, banks and administrative buildings, fish-tailed Cadillacs purr through its sweeping length. You will not find many places like Jeddah in the Middle East. Yet in spite of an almost bewildering array of Western products and machines, Jeddah still holds much of that indefinable quality which even sociologists cannot analyse, and today we must still call the magic of the East.
dressed in my one-piece, unstitched robe of cotton, with sandaled feet, with bare head in a temperature of 113 degrees Fahrenheit, I wandered farther afield. This is the obligatory garb of all who come to make the pilgrimage. None may wear silk nor anything that would show social distinctions. The town's cosmopolitan cafes, although they serve western soft drinks as well as the harsh Nejdi coffee, do not cater for any superficially westernised clientele. Although the fierce-eyed, armed-to-the-teeth Bedouin from the desert does stand out in contrast with his more sophisticated urban compatriot, yet for all this, both the well-trained Arab radio engineer or oil technician and the tribesmen from the wilds continue to conform to age-old tradition, the code which increasing prosperity only seems to make more binding. This is probably because the royal family set the fashion. The historic headcloth, bound with interlinked ropes and a voluminous camel hair cloak, remain their common heritage. The advent of newspapers and the radio, indeed, actually appear to have increased the Arab's innate appreciation of his own way of life. This is one of the most striking things about Saudi Arabia today. Unlike the people of so many eastern lands, the Saudis really feel that they are on a basis of equality with everyone else. This is why they do not ape the West in much detail. King Abdulaziz ibn Saud, in his modernization program, had to combat a very natural reluctance on the part of the more conservative elements to welcome people and machines which they did not fully understand. Just after the First World War, be it remembered, a dozen Arab nations were under colonial or quasi-colonial rule. On the other hand, the real nomad of the desert has always been free. Secure in the wilderness of the sands, following desert tracks known only to himself, he has completely escaped that fear of the interloper which haunted settled townsmen. It is from the ranks of the Bedouin, therefore, that come the country's new doctors, pilots, mechanics and technicians. Beyond the British Embassy in Jeddah lie the ancient, many-storied mansions of the merchant princes, their delicately carved rosewood lattices ajar to capture any fugitive breeze. Evidence of the invigorating role of oil royalties rises on every side, everywhere. Hawk-eyed Bedouin chiefs drive cars of such modernity that I had not seen their like even in Cairo or Beirut. Here the east meets west, one feels, and the two mingle. Flowing robes may be made of nylon. Ultra-modern automobiles are upholstered in priceless Persian antique carpeting. Running from east to west and north to south, and still triumphantly holding its own, stretches the great collection of open-fronted shops, representing innumerable trades, which is known as the souk, the market which tradition says was there when King Solomon's ships called on their voyages to the land of Punt, and where the Queen of Sheba's caravans once halted, bringing the ivory of Africa to trade for the perfumes of far Asia. This market is truly oriental, a haphazard, winding, eminently colourful avenue of old-style commerce. It may strike a western eye as primitive in some ways, yet you may purchase here not only the finest products of Birmingham and Detroit, but also priceless eastern wares. I am convinced that there is almost nothing that you cannot buy, examine or order from the world's workshops through the picturesque Jeddah souk. I bought a few things, made friends with some of the multilingual shopkeepers, yarned with them and drank innumerable cups of tea without milk, or coffee flavoured with cardamoms. On the Jeddah Mecca Highway, some three kilometres out of Jeddah, you will see by the side of the road a massive, futuristic palace. During the day, Flags of variegated hue stream from a sort of mast mounted upon the topmost turret. By night, 
there is an incessant, restless winking of signal lights. If you have hired a car, truck, station wagon, your driver may mutter as he passes this place, Long live Bar Kashab Pasha and all his children, almost as if it were an invocation. He will stop for a hurried conversation with a very businesslike Arab at a window in the palace wall. Coming home that night, as the twinkling lights come into sight, he will dip his headlights in salute. Day or night, Bar Kashab Pasha's organization is exchanging signals with his fleet of cars. Once, Barkashab was a humble, ordinary man, somewhere on the Saudi coastline, trying to earn a living by hiring out camels. Today, with the enormous expansion of transportation and the demand for vehicles of every kind, the Pasha, nobody knows where he got his title since it is not a Saudi one, has worked his way up until he can loll in luxury, if he were not such a worker. He is small, middle-aged, lithe, laughing and likeable, and when I went to see him, he asked what prospects there were of getting his boy into Eton or Oxford. His case could be multiplied more than a hundredfold throughout almost the length and breadth of Arabia. A new class of Arabs has grown up, the contractor, large farmer, industrialist, some of the sheikhs and older aristocracy, it is true, have also benefited by the new prosperity. But the two groups never mix, though each has a vital function in the Arabia of today. Go north to the American oil fields of Daharan if you want to see action, said Barkashab. Those Americans certainly are workers. And why are they successful? Because they have unknowingly applied the principles of Islam of the Prophet, who said, I regard myself as a worker. An American to whom I spoke shortly afterwards gave me his version of the question. John Q. Arab certainly is learning fast. He sure is a worker. The American way of life has gone right in there, deep. So you can take your pick. The truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. The Arab does not like to work without knowing that it will be rewarded, and it must be rewarded, if at all possible, by something really worthwhile. He is, in a sense, a natural capitalist. The word he uses for pay is my right. When the Americans came into the Saudi field, they offered not only substantial royalties even in advance of the sinking of the first well. They supplied by a clear hope that not only would the government benefit by a percentage of all oil extracted, but that there would be employment and scope for local enterprise. So the Arabs and Americans could do business. The Americans were, and still are, extremely sensitive about their position in Saudi Arabia. Every one of the 12,000 foreign employees of the Arabian American Company is schooled and drilled and dinned with the principles of the Islamic faith and the subtlety of Arabian custom. No American among them would think today of venturing anywhere except where the oil company has a right to be. And even then he lives in his robes, his headcloth and rope fillets, like an Arab desert bread. The Americans are in on a good thing. From Daharan and the surrounding deserts, a million barrels of petroleum are extracted daily. Arabian American is sitting, as it was put to me, right on top of the greatest oil field in the world. To have established this bridgehead in the sternly Wahhabite part of Arabia must be counted as one of the major victories of Western business. It may be said to have been a hard won victory, from the standpoint of pure capitalism though I am not suggesting that the Americans feel that they have had to give too much. What I can say is that Aramco is an organization in which the winning of the oil from the sands has resulted in a sharing of advantages between Arabs and Americans alike. The Americans have built the great mosque which is the dominating feature of the Saudi oil camp. 
They have drilled deep water wells in hundreds of places to provide vital sustenance for camels and people. They have their own technical training program for Saudis, hospitals, clinics, shops, agricultural missions and the rest. While a large number of foreign employees are in Dharan, nobody suggests that any foreigner be recruited if there is a Saudi who can do the job. Local contractors have even been set up in business by the company and then patronized by Aramco. While much of the enterprise which has resulted in a new prosperity for the Saudi peninsula is directly attributable to the American spirit and sheer dogged determination, yet the gigantic personality of Abdulaziz ibn Saud can conclusively be said to have been the power behind almost everything that has been accomplished during the past 30 years. In order to understand this fully, it will be necessary to make reference to the position of Arabia in a changing world. According to Arab tradition, mankind's first home was somewhere in the peninsula. Some point to Aden as the site of the Garden of Eden, others to Eve's reputed grave not far out of Jeddah. It is also believed that the Mecca Kaaba was first built by Adam himself, on the model of a house of worship in paradise, where the angels endlessly circumambulated, praising their Lord. Further, the Arabs of today claim descent from Abraham through Ishmael, who, they hold, was the son offered by the patriarch to God. Abraham rebuilt the Kaaba and sacred shrine of Arabia in token of repentance for having cast Hagar out into the wilderness. Hence the sanctity of Hagar's well in the sanctuary, the Zamzam, believed to be the same stream which God caused to spring miraculously for Hagar's succor. It is, of course, well known that the Arabs and Jews are both of Semitic origin and that their languages are derived from a similar root. There is some likelihood on the face of it that in ancient times the Arabs followed the Hebrew religious dispensation. While the Jews, however, maintained to a greater or lesser degree their monotheism, the Arabs, in the tribal wandering throughout the great deserts, lapsed into a theology which was based on a number of gods. These took two forms. The main deities represented the sun, moon and planets, while the lesser ones were totems which watched over individual tribes. The sanctity of Mecca remained in their observances, and the sanctuary, Haram, became the home of over 300 idols. The rites of pilgrimage, adapted to the worship of the gods, continued uninterruptedly. This was the period of the Jahiliyyah, Days of Ignorance, which existed until the 7th century of the Christian era, when Muhammad preached a return to monotheism. Muhammad was, as is fairly well known, a member of the most noble clan of the Arabs, the Quraysh, who were shrine keepers at the Haram. It was in the mountains near Mecca that the first chapters of the Quran, literally the recitation, were revealed to Muhammad, as Muslims believe, by the Archangel Gabriel. According to this mandate, Muhammad was commanded to lead the people out of ignorance, to tell them to worship one God alone, and to follow the code of morality and law, which, Islam says, has been carried out through successive prophets. Every nation has had a warner, is the dictum. Islam which means submission to the will of God, is therefore not regarded as a new religion. According to the Quran, it is the modern manifestation of the preaching of Moses and Jesus. Islam thus recognizes the Jewish dispensation, as does Christianity, but accepts Jesus, whom the Jews do not, on the restricted basis of his being a divinely inspired man and not a divine being. All this has a definite bearing upon Arabian and world history subsequent to Muhammad's mission. After the persecutions and trials common to all great religious teachers, Muhammad found that his preaching had eventually converted almost all Arabia. But Islam was for the whole world, this is fundamental, 
so it must be spread. When he died, Muhammad had just completed his exchange of letters with neighboring rulers, calling upon them to accept Islam. Under Muhammad's immediate successors, the Arab tribes, unified for the first time in history, poured forth from the deserts and conquered all North Africa to the Atlantic, all the Holy Roman Empire, and what are now Turkey, Persia, and Afghanistan. Under successive dynasties, Islam became the most powerful force on earth. Muslim reached the borders of France and Austria, pushed far into China, overcame all India, marched into the Russian steppes. For several hundred years, the Islamic centers of learning retrieved and developed lost sciences and became the magnet for seekers after knowledge everywhere. Islam had by now become a composite civilization, as well as a religion and social order. With the entry of the Persian, Indian and European elements, a synthesis had been produced. For a thousand years, scientists, mystics and artists were always able to find some permissive part of the world of Islam in which to work. Then came the destruction of the military and cultural force of the new world state. The eruption of the pagan Mongol hordes from Central Asia literally ground the Muslims into a mire of their own blood and the ruins of their cities, farms, universities. From this blow, Islam has never really recovered. True, the Mongols eventually accepted Islam, but so much had been lost that it has taken nearly 800 years to revive. Saudi Arabia became subject to Ottoman Turkey. Deep in their desert strongholds, the Bedouin were little affected by what went on in the world. But they nursed their heritage, the possession of the Quran, and the knowledge that it had been under Arabs and Muslims that their power had extended from Spain to China. The Turks were driven out of Arabia by an alliance between Bedouins, Hijazi Arabs and the British, in which rebellion the late T. E. Lawrence played such a part. But the northern area, home of the Wahhabites, had never really been under effective Turkish control. Even before the First World War, the Saudis, the family of Ibn Saud, were working and fighting to regain control of Nejd, their former homeland. By 1902, the 20-year-old Ibn Aziz Ibn Saud had captured the northern fortress of Riyadh. The descendants of the Prophet, who were nominal rulers of Mecca in the south, and who cooperated with the British to throw off the Turkish yoke, had to leave and set up their own small kingdoms in Iraq and Transjordan. Saud made himself master of virtually all peninsular Arabia. The first period of his reorganization of the country pacified the tribes under the banner of Saud the Great. Then the effete South was visited with severe punishment, and all extravagances were put down. Domes and minarets were leveled, for example, as being importations foreign to the simple spirit of Islam. Although a friend of the king, for example, my father was caned in the street for lighting a cigarette. But Ibn Saud could not go any further with his big plans for the development and uplift of seven million Arabs without more money than any Arab could conceive of at that time. For nearly 20 years, Saudi Arabia depended solely upon customs dues and the few million pounds that the pilgrims brought each year for their expenses. Then, in 1933, King Abdulaziz arranged with American companies to drill for oil. I was told by one veteran of those days that the geologists... I was told by one veteran of those days that the geologists were convinced that somewhere here in the wild and hostile Wahhabi country, lay the world's largest deposit. But it took them five years of wildcat, random drilling, to locate it. After they did, Saudi Arabia never had to look back. Arabia had become front-page news. 
In the days just before the Second World War, Germans, Italians, and even the Japanese fought for oil and commercial concessions. Britain and America were reported to be at loggerheads because, it was said, Britain thought that she should have a greater interest in the oil. Ibn Saud weathered it all. During the last war, he was one of the few neutral statesmen who consistently supported the Allied cause. When Vichy held Syria in an uneasy pro-Axis grip, and Rashid Ali El Gailani revolted in Iraq, all seemed lost to the United Nations. Ibn Saud, as I was told in Riyadh, could easily have thrown in his lot with the Germans and would have had little to lose. Deprived of his oil, the British and American fleets and mercantile marine would have been crippled in this part of the world. The Japanese could have made liaison with the Germans via the Arabian coastline, and the Suez route between India and Europe made completely impossible. Persia would have been outflanked. Even if the Germans had won the war, the Arabs believe that such is the value of the oil fields at Dahran and elsewhere in Nejd, they could have negotiated a peace based upon the security of the wells. For no matter how strong the Americans may be in this area, not one drop of oil can be pumped without active Arab friendship. This cooperation could come only through the Saudi regime. But Saud had given his word. This survey of Arabian history has only noted the highlights. Ibn Saud's own life story, for instance, is one of the world's classic accounts of one man battling against odds, which, as you read it, seem almost insane. Equally, the fact that the Saudi royal family is now almost fabulously wealthy does not mean that they have waxed rich on oil at everyone else's expense. The very contrary is the case. Visualise the position of Saudi Arabia in 1938, when the first royalties were coming in. Here was a country just about as underprivileged as any in the world. There were no roads, almost no electric light, no aircraft, factories, industries, banking, insurance, public security, national currency, hygiene, drainage. There was one newspaper and no radio station. Education was carried on by aged and often blind clerics, teaching small boys the Quran by heart. There were no building materials except mud and a little wood. Where would you start? There was only one way to do it. Ibn Saud bought the lot himself. He surrounded himself with all the talent that came his way. Most of those men were still with him when I made this visit, and I had the privilege of meeting them. There was Sheikh Abdullah El Fadl, the financial brain, Sheikh Hafiz Waba, the shrewd diplomat and Egyptian, Sheikh Abdullah Suleiman from the north in charge of economic affairs, and Fuad Bey Hamza, the Syrian, who carried the country through many a crisis. Saud, in advising Rashid Ali against military action aimed at Britain, is on record as having said, I am a staunch friend of Great Britain, inheriting this friendship from my grandfather, Faisal ibn Turki. When a friend is under duress, then, for the sake of friendship, one does not act against him. Personally, if I had sufficient armaments, I would have gone to the help of Great Britain and not acted against her. With the exception of the question of Palestine, Great Britain did nothing against Arab interests, and the present war is one of life and death. So our duty, if unable to help Britain, is to be neutral. This is the least that I can do. Although King Ibn Saud declared war on Germany and Japan eventually, he did not allow this to affect in the least the age-old code of Arab and Muslim hospitality. Those Arabs who had supported the Axis powers during the Second World War and fled to him for asylum from the Allies were unconditionally granted protection. When I returned to Jeddah from Riyadh after seeing the king, I was told, off the record, 
of something that had taken place just before I saw His Majesty. Someone had got the idea that I was a spy of some sort, and this rumour had reached the king's ears. Ibn Saud thundered in open court at his informant. This is our guest. If he is a spy, let him spy. He will not be able to combat the strength of our faith, which is the most powerful thing that we have. And if he is not a spy, as I believe he is not, then Allah will punish you with all his power, for there is no mercy for intriguers. But I did not know of the whispers which had preceded me to the court, and continued my preparations to journey Mecca woods, to the shrine of the Black Stone. Do you want both egg and omelette? Proverb. The dead depend upon the living. Proverb.